people of God. Today is our Thanksgiving service. And uh, we are going to be looking into the topic, a, deep, a deeper look into the Lord's Prayer. We want to have a deeper look into the Lord's Prayer. We want to go a bit further, you know, reviewing that, uh, that prayer. I'm sure we all know what, uh, what the Lord's Prayer is. You know, we are all familiar with it, right from even before we became Christians. You know, we have always been reciting the Lord's Prayer, and it's a, it's a wonderful prayer. You know, the, um, that particular prayer, you know, the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, is recorded in two books of the Bible. We see it in the, books, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, from verse 9 to 13. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 9 to 13, tells us about the Lord's Prayer. Then also in Luke chapter 11, if you read from verse 2, also talks about the Lord's Prayer. Even though they, they introduce it differently, in the case of Matthew, Matthew, you know, Matthew uh, introduces the Lord's Prayer as part of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ was teaching, and he was telling people how to pray, that when you want to pray, go into your closet, shut your door, and all that and all that. And don't keep repeating yourself, this is how you should pray. Then he now gave us uh, the Lord's Prayer. But when Luke explained it, Luke, you know, Luke said that the disciples came to the Lord Jesus Christ and they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Then he gave the Lord's Prayer. So, you know, two different accounts, but the two, the prayers are the same. I mean, um, you know, normally, you know, in life, two people don't give the same account, you know. I mean, they don't give, they don't give an account of the same thing the same way. You know, it's possible that maybe when Jesus Christ, when the disciple first asked him, you know, teach us how to pray, maybe the man, maybe Matthew was not even there. You know, it's possible that he wasn't there. So he would give an account of what he saw. So in his own case, when he was there, Jesus took it as part of his message, you know. Bottom line is that the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gave it to us. Now, here is some background to the Lord's Prayer. Now, of course, the disciples of Jesus Christ, they were brought up, you know, under the religion called Judaism. You know, Judaism under the law of Moses. They were not brought up as Christians. They were brought up under Judaism. They served, you know, they grew up under the law of Moses and all that. And under the law of Moses, you know, the, the, uh, the, people percep the people's perception of God was completely different from what we have today. In our own case, God is our father. Now, under that dispensation, God was not their father. Under the, under the Judaism law, God was not their father. It was after the death of Jesus Christ that God now adopted us, then we became children of God. That is why under the law of Moses, you will not see anybody called a child of God. Because the truth was that they were not children of God. At that time, they were not children of God. They had not been adopted. It was when Jesus Christ came that we got adopted into, into the house of God. That is why the Bible said that we are now, you know, Jesus Christ was, was given to us so that he would be the firstborn among many, among many brethren. So it was, uh, so our dispensations are completely different. For us, you know, G, I mean, God is our father. So they must have seen something in the life of Jesus. Jesus had been telling them that God is his father. And Jesus has also been telling them that God was their own father. That's after he came. And, you know, they must have seen manifestation and demonstration of the power of God in the life of Jesus. They must have seen that prayer was the secret of Jesus. Because Jesus would go into the mountain and he would pray all night. He would come, you know, he was always praying. And in their own case, they didn't even know how to pray. They didn't even, they even find it difficult to understand that, you know, God could be anybody's father. In fact, one of the reasons why the Jews wanted to kill Jesus was because Jesus called God his father. He said, how can you call God your father? You are a mere man. How can a human being be a child of God? You are blaspheming, and they wanted to stone him to death because they couldn't understand what he was saying. So the disciples, they, they saw the life of Jesus. They saw that the life of Jesus was so different. 
There was so much power, you know, in his life. And that was why the, the Pharisees, they couldn't stop him. Because Jesus was telling them, God is my father. They said, no, God can't be your father. You know, they can't you see me doing the work of God? And they didn't have any answer to that. You know, and it was difficult for them. Praise the Lord. You know, so at some point, they now came to Jesus. That, Please teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. We see you doing this thing all the time. Teach us how to pray. So what Jesus did was to now give them the guideline of prayer. You know, the, what we call the Lord's Prayer is a guideline. It's not something that God expects us to recite all the time. So the Lord's Prayer is not to be recited. It's just to give us a guideline of the format that prayer will follow. Of course, we heard Jesus himself pray so many times. For instance, you know, he prayed in the book of John, John chapter 17. He wasn't reciting the Lord's Prayer. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, if it is possible for you, take this, you know, this, uh, you know, this away from me. And of course, he wasn't reciting the Lord's Prayer. The disciples prayed so many times when they wanted to replace Judas, they prayed. When they were persecuted, they prayed. You know, all the time they prayed, they were not reciting the Lord's Prayer. When Paul was also praying, you know, Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, he prayed for the church in, 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 uh, in Colossians, he prayed for the church in Philippians. Every time that Paul prayed, he didn't recite the Lord's Prayer. You know, so the point we are making is that the Lord's Prayer is supposed to be used as a guide. It should be a guideline to the way we pray, not necessarily that we have to be, to be reciting it. Praise the Lord. And if you also look at the Lord's Prayer more deeply, you will realize that it's actually a guide into our relationship with God, the way we relate with God. It's actually, it's not just something that we should do when we come to church, so to say. You know, the Lord's Prayer is not just a guide to praying, it's also a guide into how we relate with God. Let us, let us, let us read it. Let's read the Lord's Prayer. Let's read the one we are familiar with, King James Version. Okay. So it says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So that is the format that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to us. And like we said, you know, he doesn't expect us to be reciting it all the time. But it's supposed to be a guide to how we pray. And it's actually a guide to our lifestyle. So we are just going to spend today and next Sunday, by the grace of God, to look deeper at what, you know, what constitutes the Lord's Prayer. You know, what are really the components of the Lord's Prayer. You know, and um, the first thing that we see in the Lord's Prayer is that now Jesus Christ is the one telling the disciples, say, when you pray, say this, our Father. So, Jesus Christ is telling us that God is our Father. And that's the first thing that we see in the Lord's Prayer. That's the first thing that the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us, that God is our Father. That's the first thing we need to know, that God is our Father. Now, when we say God is our Father, what that means or the, the idea that comes to your mind would depend on the kind of father you had when you were growing up. Of course, you know, depending on where you came from, where I came from, when you hear father, you hear somebody who is so hard, who is so difficult, he doesn't even understand why you should be smiling. I mean, why are you smiling? He's just wondering, what, why are you, why, what, don't you have anything to do? You are just smiling. Smiling for what? What is so funny, you know? That's the kind of, that's the kind of interpretation many of us are used to. But when God is talking about it, he's talking about a real, modern, loving father. He's talking about a loving father. What a father is really supposed to be. 
So when we hear of Father, what should come, the first thing that should come to our mind is somebody who is loving. Somebody who understands his responsibility. You know, and calling God our Father means that God is not an impersonal thing. You know, when people say God, this, you know, actually some occultic uh, group, they believe that God is just a force. You know, it's just like a force just out there that nobody knows it. No, God is a person. God is a father. God is indeed our father. And he used, the, you know, he has, the Bible said that he has adopted us as son. So he used human relationship, human type of relationship so that we can understand how to relate with him. God expects us to relate with him as children. He wants us to see him as a father. Not somebody who is always looking for every opportunity to destroy us. But somebody that is looking for every reason to bless us. That's what a father is. A father is somebody that loves you so much and is looking for the best in you. Even when you make a mistake, when you mess up, a father is somebody that wants to bring you up and put you back on track and make sure that you attain the best for your life. That is what God is. And that is what God wants us to understand. As a father, God has adopted us into his family. We see that in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. God adopted us. You know, the Bible said that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father. That means Jesus Christ is the one that only came directly from the Father. But the rest of us, even though we were not begotten like Jesus, but we were adopted into the family. Legally, when you adopt a child into a family, that child has all the legal rights of the children that were naturally born into that family. And that is why God has used the word adoption. So we were adopted into God's family. When you are adopted into a family, you change your last name. You now adopt the last name of the new family that you come into. You don't continue to carry the whole last name. No, you change your last name. And it's the same thing. When we came to the family of God, we changed our last name. We are, no longer, we are no longer of the world. We now belong to the almighty God. So everything, so Jesus Christ becomes our brother. Jesus becomes our brother because we have been adopted into the family. And as a father, God loves us. God loves you. Romans chapter 8 from verse 35 to 39 says, what can separate us from the love of God? And it begins to list a lot of things that people can imagine might uh, prevent them from enjoying the love of God. And he said that, no, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, 1 John chapter 3 is talking about, he said, how great the love that God has for us, that we are called children of God. God really, really loves us. He loves us. That's why, you know, you, you know, the prayer we took just before the message, you know, he said, when you go through, the, wh whatever you go through, I'm going to be there with you. Whatever you are going through. Because you are my son. You are my child. God loves you. He's a father. He's interested in you. Regardless of what you are facing, regardless of what people have said to you, it doesn't really matter. God is your father and he loves you dearly. You know, he will do anything for you. You know, I mean, sometimes when you even read the Bible, you, say, <laughs> you see something, you say, God, this is not fear. He says he's going to give people for your life. That's what God says. So that means if the situation is so bad that somebody has to go, that person will not be you. He said he's going to give people as ransom for you. He will give people as ransom for you. You know, God is your father and he loves you. God will protect you as a father. He gave that promise in Psalm 91. He said, as long as you dwell in my secret place, you will abide under my shadow. He said, so many things can happen outside, but they will not come near you. That is God for you. God helps us, his children. He helps his children. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible said that we should come boldly 
to the throne of grace so that we can receive help and mercy in times of need. God is willing to help us. You know, a lot of the times we carry burdens that we are not even supposed to carry. Many times we have gone through the challenges and the difficulties carrying those burdens on our own. Then by the time you can't go further, you now remember God. Okay, God, oh, please help me. But you should have done that right from the beginning. And a lot of the time, by the time you now pray, God now helps you, you now start wondering why. Wow, this is so easy for God. I should have called him in the first place. That's what you need to do. Don't see any challenge as, you know, oh, I cannot do this. I don't need to bother God. No, let him do it for you. He said he wants to be your burden, burden bearer. So just let him do it for you. He wants to help us, his children. Our God is compassionate. He's compassionate. He has compassion. He feels for us. He feels for us. Even when we get ourselves into trouble, even when we get ourselves into trouble, you know, he will always help us. Again, he says that in Romans chapter 8. He said, all things work together for good for those who love God, who are they called according to his purpose. Now, this is one aspect of God that is so difficult to understand. Because you cause a problem for yourself. Now, if you genuinely repent, not that you are playing games with God. If you genuinely repent, that problem you cause, God will now use it to work something out for you. Then you now start wondering, ah, does it mean that God wanted me to do this thing in the first place? No. It's just the aspect of God that you can't understand. You get yourself into trouble. The moment you genuinely repent, that same problem you brought on yourself, God will now use it for something good. He did it for David. David, David messed up. He killed a man. He took the wife. And of course, God was very mad at him. But the moment David repented, God said, okay, from that same woman, you are now going to have a child that will succeed you. I mean, you start wondering, why should God do that? Why should God do that? A child that came, of, came out of adultery. Why should that be the one that will succeed David? But that's God for you. Because the moment you come to God, genuinely repented, God has forgotten. God will now use the problem you caused to work something out for you. That's God for you. He's so compassionate. He knows that we are human. He knows that we are subject to making mistakes. You know, sometimes we say that God is disappointed in me. Yeah, sometimes, and sometimes we do things that God is not happy about. But the truth is, he's never disappointed in you. Because he knows that you are, you, you are not even as good as you think you are. So it can't be, there's nothing you can do that can make it disapp that can disappoint him. He knows that you are just ordinary, you are just, you know, subject to being blown around. That is why whenever you come to, don't think he's disappointed. He knows that, what, what, I mean, what can come out of this one anyway? It's only his grace that makes the difference. Only grace of God makes the difference in our lives. So don't think you can do something that is too much that God will not, ah, ah, how can you do this? No, 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 not God. There's nothing you can do that will surprise him. He's always ready to accept you. He knows you are human. He knows that we just, you know, we, are, we, we just move based on what we see. So he's compassionate. Praise the Lord. Our God provides for us. You know, he never gives up on us. He's the God that provides. He said, that, look, if I can provide for the birth of the air, how much more you? He said, don't worry about all those things. Matthew chapter 6. He said, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. You know, so God, God sees, he sees his seed in us, you know, the Holy Spirit that he has put in us, that is what he sees. God sees us more than our shortcomings, sees us more than our mistakes. He's a father that is very responsible, praise the Lord. So that is the father that we have, the Bible says that our father. Then the second thing that we see in the Lord's Prayer is that our God is in heaven. God is in heaven. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible said that God dwells in the midst of glory that nobody can approach. Nobody can come there. Nobody can go near where God is. That is the Father we have. He's in heaven. 
and where he is, nobody can come there. Jesus said that nobody has ever seen God except the one that came from above. Only Jesus has seen him. We are talking of God the Father now. Praise the Lord. Now, because he, see, he sits in heaven, he sees everything that is happening here on earth. He is above all. God is above everything. He's just watching everything. Even the demons and the devil and all of them. He's watching. They are all under him. He sees everything. He sees everything and he's above everything. He has control over everything. Like I've said here before, do you know that God sends the devil on message, on errand? He created the devil. He still sends the devil on errand sometimes. Some jobs are dirty for angels to do. God will send the devil to go and do it. He sends the devil on it. So God is always in control. So the father you have, and like I've also mentioned so many times, God does not fight the devil. God created the devil. He doesn't fight him. He doesn't fight him. You know, so he sits in heaven. He has full control of whatever is happening. He has never lost control. He will never lose control. Let's read Revelation 20. Revelation 20. There's something I always like to see in that passage. Revelation 20 is one passage of the Bible that the devil is always mad when we read it. Because it disgraces him. And because of that, I always like to read it. Revelation 20, says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a, a thousand, for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that, he must be lose a little season. That this is something that is going to happen in the future. Now, look at, look at it. It is not God that speaks the devil. It's an angel. Now, the Bible said that the angel had a great chain. So that means the angel was carrying the chain on one hand. So that means it is only one hand that is available to pick the devil. <laughs> so, so this angel had a chain in one hand. I will just use the other hand to pick the devil. And he just threw him in the bottomless pit and locked the, you know, locked the guy up. So you see, this guy is not as powerful as we think. He's not. God is not in the business of fighting the devil. God is above all in heaven. He's above everything. He knows everything that is going on and he has full control. So don't be afraid of the devil. As long as you are not living in sin, if you go into sin, then you are in trouble. If you go into sin, please quickly run out and repent. Because that is the only way the devil can get you. But if you keep away from sin, he can't get you. He cannot. He will deceive you. You know, he will show some movies to you on TV, and you see the Dracula, and you see those, ah, you say, ah! The upper is a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's not that powerful. Then the third thing that we see, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means our God is to be honored. Like I said, the Lord's Prayer is, a, is even a reflection of how we should live. So, God is to be honored. God deserves our honor because of his great mercy, because of the mercy that he has shown to us. See that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And one thing we need to know is that the level, the amount of honor you give to God is actually going to reflect in your life. It's going to affect the way God relates with you. The, the way you honor God, the way you honor him, is going to reflect on how much, he, on, on how he relates with you as well. Let's see 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. God himself said it. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. Say, wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the, the Lord said, be it far from me. In other words, I'm changing my mind. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be likely esteemed. So God said, tit for tat. If you honor me, I will honor you. If you dishonor me, I'm going to dishonor you. God made it very clear. 
So we need to make sure that we honor God in our lives. How do you honor God? You honor God by obeying him. When he gives you an instruction, because when you call somebody your father, when you call somebody your Lord, then you have to obey him. If you are not obeying God, you are dishonoring him. Jesus Christ said that you are my friend when you do what I please, when you do what I say. That means if you don't do what I say, then we are no longer friends. So you need to respect God. We need to honor God. You know, in the book of, um, in Malachi chapter 1 from verse 6 to 8, Malachi 1, 6 to 8, let's quickly read that please. He said, a son honors the father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts, unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have ye despised thy name? You know? So then, of course, it begins to talk about them not paying their tithes, bringing polluted uh, offerings to them and all that. You know? So we need to really honor God. And to honor, I mean, the way to honor God is to obey him. Another way to honor God is by honoring him with our material blessings. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Proverbs 3, 9. It's also a way of honoring God. Say, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. You know, we are so loud to say, my money, my this. It's only because you have your mental faculty working that you can make money. God can make you mad. And then we'll see what will happen to what you call your money. We should learn to honor God. We should I mean, we honor our parents. If you, if, you, if, you have, if you see our parents alive, and you don't honor them with your material substance, then you are not doing what is right. Because part of what a child should do is to honor the parents. You know, I remember, you know, in my family, <laughs> you know, there was a time, you know, my, my, uh, my father, not my father in heaven, my father on earth, you know, he was celebrating his birthday. <laughs> and, you know, all of us children were still coming together, gathering money together, we wanted to buy him a car and all that. Of course, before the money could complete, the man has already bought the type of car he wanted. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> com- all of us combined, the man is richer than all of us. <laughs> but we still send him money. How? Why? It's just to honor him. So, when you give money to God, it's not because God is hungry. It's just an honor. It's just a way to honor him. You know, where I came from, when, when your parents are trained you to go to school, by the time you now finish school and you get your job, your first salary, you give it to your parents. That's what we do here on earth. That is the first fruit. <laughs> you know? So we do it for God. So it's just a way of honoring God. So what God is telling you is, you need to honor me. And by the way, if your children are here, when you are celebrating your birthday, they, don't, they buy you only card, and, and they have the money to buy more. You need to teach them. If they are too small and they don't have the money, give them the money. Say, what gift are you going to buy for me? Teach them to do all these things. You know, because if you don't teach them, by the time they grow up, they will not do it. The Bible says that we should teach our children the way they should go. So that when they grow up, they will not depart from it. Teach your children to buy you gifts. Put the, buy the card for them. Tell them, address it to me. It is my birthday. Address this card to me. Yeah, let them know how to do all those things. Praise the Lord. So in conclusion, <laughs> prayer does not necessarily start when you kneel down to pray. Our entire life is a life of prayer. The Lord's Prayer teaches us how to relate with God so that we will know, you know, how to get our prayers answered. Can we just stand up and just pray? Let's just talk to God.